Let me just check if there's more people coming. Are we ready or yes. more coming? No, no. All right. All right. So uh, let's get started. Sec second part uh, of partial differential equations. So now what we're going to do today uh, is to actually start with thinking about partial differential equations and putting down some basic mathematical concepts. Um, we, so today it's really more about theory. We will not talk about so, so of the continuum problem. We will not talk about numerics. So therefore, in the lab, again, we will focus on ordinary differential equations and we just uh, continue what, it, we did, what we did uh, yesterday, what I already mentioned. So the focus of today is going to be to so generalize your ordinary differential equations code to handle systems of ODAs and then solve the two-body problem in GR for point particles and this approximation where I wrote down the equations yesterday. So basically taking Newtonian orbits with an energy loss, which is uh, given by this first order expression, the so-called quadrupole uh, formula, which you can find in textbooks, and I will, which I had on the slides yesterday. And then we'll have a handout at the beginning of the session, which, which has the equations again. And again, just do the same thing. Uh, you did yesterday, carry out the conversions test, evaluate the numerical error, make some plots, try to understand what's going on in the system. Right? Now, let's switch to partial differential equations. Uh, what's the motivation? Well, the motivation is that the Einstein equations are partial differential equations. Uh, if you learn general relativity, if you take your, you know, almost all of you have taken a class in general relativity, you need to understand the basics of differential geometry to understand how this theory is formulated. Uh, however, if, if you want to work in general relativity, you want to solve the Einstein's equations, it turns out that you know, for most problems, there's only so much differential geometry which you need. And what you really need is to know quite a bit about how to solve partial differential equations. Okay? Um, so, so this is where we try to fill in you know, of course, all of you probably, you have had some classes on partial differential equations, you know, mathematical methods for theoretical physicists, things like this class, kind of classes. And now we just try to build on that and just put in a few more, to remind you of certain things which you already know, and then fill in a few more details which we need uh, to approach this problem for the Einstein equations. A bit more of, of motivation, right? Classical physics is formulated in terms of partial differential equations for tensor fields. Um, if you want to understand the physical theory which is given in terms of such uh, partial differential equations, uh, then what we have to do is we have to understand the space of the solutions of, the, of these PDAs that describe the theory. Um, we have to understand what predictions are these solutions making for observations. And that may not at all be obvious. We have to ask, do these partial differential equations have any solutions? For example, you, you, know, you, you want to you, you, you formulate a new theory of some particle physics interaction. I don't know. You have formulated your theory. It will imply some partial differential equations uh, for these fields. Well, do these partial differential equations have any solutions? If they don't, it's not a good physical theory. Okay? And it's not obvious that, that this is true. Can the solutions, are the solutions well defined? Can they become singular? Uh, what degrees of freedom do these partial differential equations have? And how do we actually, you know, such partial differential equations which describe a physical theory, obviously they have, they have to have a very large set of solutions which adapt to all the possible physical situations it describes. But how do we select a specific solution? Okay? In, uh, in classical physics, somehow, we have this underlying assumption that what we should always be able to do is somehow specify the state of the physical system at some time. And then the equations are going to tell us how this state is going to evolve into, uh, in time in some deterministic matter, we, manner. We always expect that a theory has these properties. It turns out, for the Einstein equations, this is not so obvious, but it turns out to be true. Okay? This is, one of, this is somehow the, 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 the central, central theme also, how to derive this of Thomas's lectures. If you can formulate your theory as a time evolution problem, you know, starting with some initial data, is this time evolution unique? And does it, for example, does it depend continuously on your initial data? If it doesn't con depend continuously on, on your initial data, then it's somehow 
so in this, in this time evolution, miracles appear because you have some state of the system and then there would be some discontinuous change. Uh, this, this doesn't quite fit with how we usually understand what happens in classical physics. It would be very strange. And we need a systematic way to produce solutions. In general, we will not be able to find, we may be able to find some uh, exact solutions, but we will not find you know, all solutions in closed form. So we need some general way of finding approximate solutions and do it in a systematic way that in principle our program to, to, to cover solutions can explore the whole, the whole solution space. Okay, what, what types of partial differential equations uh, do we have? For the moment we just start simple, just linear and this is really just a reminder of things we, you already know. Um, we can classify PDEs by the kind of problem that can naturally be associated with this equation, okay? And depending on the equation, we will find that uh, for some equations, it's an initial value problem or a boundary value problem. For example, if you're on Laplace's equation, it wants, naturally, it wants a boundary value pr problem or you will have, or maybe you have to specify both initial values and boundary value problems, but boundary values, and then it's an initial boundary value problem, okay? There are, there are four standard types which, which uh, I want to mention, which are all relevant for physics. And of two of these are, uh, we're going to talk about more. There are hyperbolic equations, and these are the generalized wave equation. And the basic physics in these uh, equations is that there is some information which propagates at finite speed. So this is um, some other prototype of a relativistic field equation that it's relativistic, it describes information which propagates at finite speed, okay? Uh, and this is uh, essentially the focus of this week, to understand hyperbolic partial differential equations. Uh, next week, uh, we'll mention a little bit elliptic ones, and this is uh, a focus for next week. Elliptic equations are, for example, like the, Poisson, the Laplace equation or the Poisson equation. Uh, they are usually, they are boundary value problems, for example, uh, corresponding to finding some time independent solution, okay? There are two other types that are very important, but we're not gonna talk about them because they play a very minor role in relativity. These are parabolic equation, equations which generalize the heat equation, for example, and uh, they, some of these, these are well posed, so they make sense only in one direction of time. If you write them like this, they only make sense forward in time. Um, and then there's the Schrodinger equation, which uh, so, so, so in the parabolic uh, case, information propagates instantaneously. The same in the Schrodinger equation, which is it's a little bit like a complex version of a, a, a parabolic equation. And these two we're not going to talk about because uh, they don't naturally arise in, in relativity because in relativity, information does not propagate instantaneously. Okay? Um, all right. Let's just uh, spend a second on this idea of the time evolution problems can give rise to boundary value problems. So a standard case is where we look for a stationary, means time independent solution, some kind of equilibrium state. So think of the simplest example, we have the wave equation here, and then we demand that the solutions are time independent and we get an elliptic problem, okay? Uh, we could also, for example, we could ask for periodic solutions in time, that we make an ansatz where, where uh, the time dependence is periodic, and then we would get a kind of an eigenvalue problem. <laughs> it also turns out that the known fundamental theories of nature, general relativity, electric theory, QCD, they're all gauge theories, okay? I, think, I assume that you're all well aware of this. And um, it turns out that um, the presence of gauge freedom in, in a and a physical system that very naturally leads to having constraints, which means that you cannot choose your initial data freely, they are subject to some restrictions. Uh, and these uh, restrictions on the space of initial data, because they deal with the initial data, they're not time evolution problem, and it turns out they also typically take the form of elliptic boundary value problems. And Mark's lecture will, will tell you much more about this uh, for GR. Now, um, I want to tell you a few words about Maxwell's theory. I think maybe Thomas will also mention the analogy with Maxwell's theory. 
Uh, but I think it's so, it's so important and fundamental. You can, and even if you have heard it before, it doesn't matter to hear it again. Um, Maxwell's theory is much, much simpler than GR. It's linear, but uh, it, it shares many of the features and many of the basic issues can already be understood from Maxwell. Now, you could start, for example, Maxwell, just to start it very similar to GR, you could start with this uh, four-dimensional um, formulation. Who is, who is not familiar with writing in this way? Everybody, right? No? Yes? Yes, great. Okay, so we, right, we can just um, write it this way. There's this anti-symmetric tensor F <laughs> for which we have two equations. And now what we could do, we could introduce a space-time split just in a way that uh, Thomas is now deriving this step by step for the Einstein equation. So here we have our manifold M, and then we define some constant in time surfaces. They have a time-like unit normal, Na, which is normalized to minus one. And then we can make two funny definitions using the anti-symmetric tensor F and project this with the time-like unit normal N. And we so there's a object, a vector called E, which is constructed in this way, and then a vector called B, constructed uh, with the three-dimensional uh, epsilon tensor, which is induced on this uh, hypersurface here. And then these turn out to be the standard electric and magnetic fields, E and B. Okay? Uh, now, if we insert this definition into our four-dimensional <laughs> equations, it turns out we get four equations out of this, four equations for E and B. Um, so here they're here they're written down. Two of them here, the ones in green, they carry time derivatives and they just uh, tell us something about how the time derivative of the electric field or the magnetic field is related to the other field and the sources. Okay? And then we get two more equations which are mysterious, um, which do not contain time derivatives. I apologize for choosing red, which I think one cannot see it very well, but you know these equations anyway, so it doesn't matter. Okay? So they, stay, they give us information about the divergence of these fields. Uh, the divergence of E is 4 pi rho. The divergence of B is 0. If there's vacuum, both are divergence free. And then, of course, the, if you do have matter, if rho is not 0, then you have to solve the Maxwell equations consistently with the equations that uh, describe the, mo the motion of the, of the charged matter. It's very, very similar to what we have in... in um, General relativity, there's the, the metric, which describes the, the interaction, and then there is the energy momentum tensor, which here just is J and rho. And we have to solve, if you have matter, we don't just have to solve the Einstein equations, we have to solve the Einstein equations coupled to whatever um, equations we have for the matter fields. Okay, so this is the basic setup. Important, we have these two types of equations. And then there's a very simple exercise that, that you can do. Um, which you know, is apart from the, from the lab things, what I, I really recommend is it's just like two or three lines. What you can show is that the constraints propagate, uh, as we usually say. This means uh, that the constraints are satisfied by virtue of the evolution equations if they're satisfied at t equals zero. Okay? And if this wouldn't be true, then the whole Maxwell theory doesn't make much sense because there's a restriction on the initial data, but this, this restriction wouldn't be preserved this is not consistent, okay? Uh, usually if you learn Maxwell's theory, this, this just things are you know, assumed to make sense. But it is something, if this would be a, a, a complicated theory, like Einstein's, like Einstein's equations, this is not so obvious, and you have to show that this basic property is really true. So in, in this sense, the initial value problem for Maxwell's theory makes sense. This, the constraints are preserved, and one can show that for given initial data, one ha does indeed have a unique time evolution. It does depend continuously on the initial data. And such a case of an initial value problem is called a well-posed initial value problem. Okay? Uh, well-posed, for example, in this, uh, in this sense of, uh, as yesterday we introduced this concept of, um, um, what's it called? <laughs> um, the conditioning number, sorry, the conditioning number, and so here we have a problem which, wherever this condition number is finite, we can make some predictions. Uh, and then of course we have standard properties in this theory. The information propagates of, like the speed of light, and we'll see soon 
a connection between this you know, propagation speeds and the properties of these equations as an initial value problem. Of course, just to, to complete uh, these comments, there's a different way of, of formulating the Maxwell equations with the vector potential, which I'm going to emphasize different aspects of the theory, uh, just to remind you of this. And on this way of writing the equations is also very useful to understand the analogy with general relativity. And you could solve these equations numerically, uh, which turns out to be quite difficult because what you have to do numerically is you actually have to preserve these constraints, right? If you, if you start with your initial data, uh, you have to produce initial data which are subject to these elliptic uh, equations which you have to solve. And you will only be able usually to solve these equations to some precision, okay? So we know what, what you can uh, derive here in this, in this exercise is that you, if your you know, initial data are exact, and the evolution is done exact, then the constraints will be preserved. But if you already start with a small mistake, and at every evolution time step, you make another small mistake, it's not, not so clear what happens to the constraints. Are they staying small, or are they just producing some kind of runaway? Maybe they grow exponentially. Okay. So if you do this thing numerically, you have to make sure that the constraints are not running away, that they stay controlled. And it turns out to be not that easy, but methods are known to handle this and also what's very convenient for in this case that it's very easy to make the comparison with the experiment okay which for G GI is a bit more difficult now it turns out uh, I apologize again that I cannot see this very well um, if you have if you evolve Maxwell on a curved background things turn out to be not so easy so for example what you could compute is you could just uh, compute the uh, divergence of the magnetic field so this is the quantity which would be zero, for example, if, uh, um, if you don't have matter. And then you could uh, compute a time derivative of this. I'll write this now as d by dt in some nice coordinate system. And I think uh, Thomas is going to go to the to this geometry in, in more detail. And he will, he will write this as the lead derivative. And now you can compute this from the equations. And you will see that. Where, so in flat space, the easy calculations in flat space, this would just be zero. But in general, this is not going to be zero. And you will have a result like minus k times this constraint, where k is the trace of the extrinsic curvature, which I'm not sure k i 8 If Thomas has already introduced the extrinsic curvature, yes. OK. So this is this quantity. And what you can see is that Depending on the sign of this quantity, you have a problem. Because if k is positive, the constraint is damped out. But if it's negative, it grows exponentially. And there's pretty much nothing you can do. OK, maybe just basically change a different slicing so that this quantity changes sign. But otherwise, you just, your, um, your algorithm drifts away. And it looks like no, no numerical algorithm can save you. It turns out, so, so, so an, an important thing that we learn here is that you know, this is a, even in this case with this problem, it's a well posed initial value problem, but it's a, a problem which in practice is very hard to solve because this constraints, this restriction just drives off exponentially. Okay? Now, it turns out that for the Maxwell case, it's actually very easy to, to solve this problem. You just use new variables, which is E and B with the index upstairs, uh, multiplied with the square root of the determinant of the metric. This changes the equations, and then this bad term goes away. Okay? The problem is that if you do have a curved <laughs> geometry, uh, this happens in general, not just for the Maxwell equation. It does happen for GR. And there, it's not so easy, not so clear how to solve this, okay? which for, for, for Maxwell case is quite clear. So this is a very fundamental problem in, in dealing you know, curved space evolution equations, and in particular, um, GR. Now, Let's go from, from these remarks about you know, Maxwell and its connections with GR to more fundamental things. And let's ask about, for a given PDE, do any solutions exist? Um, so let's consider a simple case. Let's consider the initial value problem for the wave equation, our standard example. So here it is again, the wave equation. And initial data, we can set them at some time. And they will be the the value of the field phi at this time, t0, is a function of x, and the time derivative of the field as a function of x. 
the value and the time derivative because it's a second order equation. So we have these two types of uh, two sets. Right. Of Where? Which one? Hmm? Here's a lot. It's a, it's a, because it's, it's Nabla squared. It's, 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 it's. The wave equation is two time derivatives, two space derivatives. Um, uh, <laughs> so, because it's second order in time, we need these two sets of initial data, right, to, to pick out a, a, a solution. Now, what we can do is we can find out that. Uh, we can also produce all higher derivatives, for example, just differentiating again in time here, a third time, that we have d by dt of the Laplace, but these are partial derivatives, we can commute them, and so we, we would have just this the third time derivative is Laplace of the time derivative, but the time derivative is part of the initial data, so we also have the third derivative, and we can iterate that, and we can compute all time derivatives. Okay, so we have all derivatives, we can write down a form of power series, a Taylor series, and the question is, does it converge? If it converges, well, that's the solution, okay? Um, and so it turns out, yes, it does for analytic initial data. This is a very powerful, powerful theorem of, of PDEs and is due to these mathematicians, Cauchy and Kovalevsky. Now, let's just uh, write it down, because this is a very, very powerful theorem. Let's just write it down, look at it a bit in detail. So here's a the theorem. Let, so let's consider Rn and let's introduce a coordinate system which is where singles out takes apart one of the coordinates, which we call t, and then the other one, the other coordinates x1 to xn minus 1. Now, consider a system of m partial differential equations. So with m unknowns, we call them phi i, and they depend on t and all the x coordinates. And so here is our uh, system of equation. It looks a bit like the wave equations. So we use it in second order form. Left hand side is second time derivative of our fields. And then some function on the right hand side, which can depend on tx, the phi's, first time derivatives, first space derivatives, and second derivatives. Okay? Uh, and what we demand is that this function f is an analytic function of all of its variables. Okay? In addition, we demand that there are two more sets of m analytic functions which just depend on the spatial coordinates f and g and then the theorem says that there exists an open neighborhood we call o of this of the hypersurface t equals constant and then within this open neighborhood there exists a unique analytic solution of rpd system such that the initial data are given by Initial field is f, initial time derivative is g. Okay? So let's just I'll make maybe just a little drawing to be sure what what we have here. So somewhere here, somewhere here we have we have you know, a, a manifold m, which in this case was just Rn. Then we start out with some surface here, some hypersurface t equals this t0. This is this one here. And then we say there exists some open neighborhood O of this hypersurface. So, you know, here, whatever this is O, goes a bit in the future, goes a bit into the past. Uh, and here we have an analytic solution of this PS, PhD, P, PhD system, yeah, PDE system. So here, here, in this area here, we know that if we give initial data at t equals constant, here we, we have that there exists a solution, and actually a unique one. Okay, because the power series converges. Now, what's the interpretation of this uh, theorem? Well, the conclusions are, first of all, the wave equation, but also similar equations. For example, the Laplace equation has exactly the same form, right? Uh, just a different sign, but otherwise the same form. So similar equations, they do have an, analyt an initial value formulation for analytic initial data. And there's a large class of solutions, an infinitely large class of solutions. There are as many solutions as there are these pairs, f and g, of initial data sets. Right? So that looks pretty good. That looks very promising. Uh, now, things are more complicated. Um, there's this a very interesting, very famous example of Levi, what happens when you have non-analytic equations. As it turns out, that even linear PDEs, even very simple linear PDEs, 
if they do not have analytic co coefficients, they do not in general have any solutions. Okay, so for example, here there's, there's a very simple uh, scalar um, PDE, which is written down in, 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 the comp in the, uh, complex numbers, but you could just you know, take real parts and then put away the complex part. It's just a way to write things down simpler. And so there's this theorem that basically if you have this simple PDE with some right-hand side phi, if there is a solution, then phi must be analytic, which means if phi is not analytic, there are just no solutions. And this is a very, very simple PDE, right? So this is something to be aware of that you, you, you come up with, you want to write down a, a PDE example for your students, for them to play around with. You just write down some equations. Well, in general, it's not going to have any solutions. Yeah? Uh, the other thing is more a physical argument that uh, for us, in a relativistic theory, analytic solutions are not enough uh, because you know, if you have an analytic solution, it determines the, uh, the whole solution, so any finite neighborhood, right? If I have here a small neighborhood of my initial data, it, it determines, if, because they, I, I have just seen that the um, Taylor series converges, it just determines this whole region here instantly. But that, that can't be true because you know, in a relativistic theory, information from here to there can only travel with the speed of light, and here it's just instant. So it's just completely inconsistent with the idea of relativity. So in a relativistic theory, um, we will see that analytic solutions can be useful, but they cannot really describe the physics of information propagates at finite speed. Yeah? So if you have you have done some, you have proven some theory, you have done some study which says as an integral technical part, let's assume all functions of analytic, that's very nice, but may not have anything to do with physics, okay? Um, so for physics, we can only require that the solutions are maybe either CK or C infinity. Usually for technical purposes in physics, we can just assume that everything is C infinity, so everything is smooth, okay? Um, now, the other thing which I already mentioned is that this uh, cauchy kovaleski theorem, it doesn't distinguish between the wave and the Laplace equations, for example, because they just fall into the same set, into the same form. And let's understand this. Let's just look at the difference between the wave and the Laplace equations in a simple example due to another famous mathematician, Hadamard. And so what he's doing is he looks at the Laplace, the, the wave equation and the Laplace equation. So here we have the wave equation. Here we have the Laplace equation. And we consider families of functions which solve these equations. So there's a family uh, un of functions, 1 over n squared sine nt sine nx, and another one v, but the only difference is that the first sinus becomes a hyperbolic sign. Uh, you will realize that I made a typo because this should obviously be v. Okay? So u the U the family of uh, solutions U solves the wave equations, and the V's, the V's solve the Laplace equation. Only difference is this one is sign here. It's different. Okay. Now let's let's have a look at these equations. Uh, at t equals zero, we have that both U and V are zero, um, but the time derivatives are actually not zero. I'm not sure where. Where did my Um, the, the, the V slipped off here. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to put it back on before I give you the final version. Okay? Now, what we can see actually is that the, the Cauchy data converge. Um, so, again, so this one, this converges to zero, okay, because it's you know, science. And the ones for the V also they converge to zero as n goes to infinity. So, initial data go to zero. For the wave equation, the whole solution goes to zero, okay? as is obvious because this is bounded. This was goes like 1 over r squared. So initial data goes to zero means the whole solution goes down to zero. Uh, but for the v's, for the Laplace equation, the vn's actually blow up because it has this hyperbolic sign term. So even if the boundary data go to zero, the solution can still blow up. So this is a, a, like a, a non-causal, a, a non-continuous dependence. And it's not what we expect from an initial value problem. Okay? And so there's this key idea that we will formulate a class of partial differential equations, which we'll call hyperbolic, for example. And these are the ones which have a stable 
uh, stable solutions for the initial value, pro value problem, which have a well-posed uh, initial value problem, which we can use to predict the future from initial data. Let's introduce another concept which is related to this um, predictability, which is the domain of dependence, which again, I think many of you may be uh, familiar with that. And so the domain of dependence is the region in the manifold, which is, uh, which you can pre predict from a certain initial hypersurface, from a certain uh, time slice. So let's fix some uh, spatial surface S. So let's think of, let's think of S as a three-dimensional hypersurface of constant time. So this, this kind of object here, okay? Let's call this S. All right, let's actually make some space. So here, right here, for example, here we had this open neighborhood, which is essentially determined by the convergence radius of the Taylor series. But again, but this is somehow, this is just a um, mathematical thing. It has nothing to do with the propagation of information. So let's just forget about this. This, has not, this is just maths, has nothing to do with physics. And now let's think about if we have initial data on this constant time hypersurface is where, or maybe even just a part of it, just to make it more specific. Yeah, so here this is a, a finite region of constant time. Which points in the manifold are determined by initial data here? Okay. Um, so for example, right here, this point here, would this point be determined by those? No, because you know, you've Let's assume our standard convention, light rays are 45 degrees, right? So, so you know, we can, from this point, we can determine maybe these ones. We have an influence on these ones, but certainly not on this, okay? All right, so let's uh, start with this idea. S is this 3D hypersurface of constant time. If you want to make it more technical, it's an, an achronal, non-time-like, embedded sub-manifold of a four-dimensional manifold M, which means that the points of S cannot communicate with each other, right? And then we can uh, make this definition the future domain of dependence, d plus of s. We will have an analogous definition for the past domain of dependence. So future domain of dependence will now go to the future. We can also do the same thing into the past. And this is the set of all points p in the manifold so, such that every past inextendable causal curve through this point p intersects s. Right? What does it mean that here so here's we have some point P in our manifold M. So it's not, this is not Rn, this is just a general manifold M. And now let's look at the, the past causal curves. This would be a past causal curve. Hmm? But we want to, this, this, this causal curve just ends here. Well, that, that makes no sense for our purposes because we want to we wanna connect it to its whole past. So we have to make these curves inextendable. So just continue them all the way. So now we have a past inextendable causal curve. And we want that each of these curves intersects S. And if each of them intersects S, this one here, now we go all causal curves, this, this does the job. Okay? Now, which are, which, which are the points which exactly now, using this definition, make up our domain of dependence? Well, of course, exactly the ones which are this kind of light cone here. These are the ones. Each, each point here has this kind of part slide cone. It fits. And so this here is therefore d plus of s. And then here we have d minus of s. OK? A side comment, what, what we see here is actually that if you want to talk about this time evolution problems, there's a strong connection between the partial differential equations aspects and the geometric aspects, which are closer to GR, right? Because here, in order to understand what are the properties of the solutions to the PDEs, we suddenly have talked about manifolds and, and causality and so on. Um, now, a few comments. So here we have just a few pictures of what, what, you know, what can happen. For example, here, an extreme picture with a surface which becomes asymptotically null. Another one, we have cut out a point. What, what does it show? Actually, I, I just, I, 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 these are, these are pictures from this world general relativity book. I just, I just scanned them with, the, with my phone. Uh, and I highly, highly recommend to 
for the initial value problem to read the chapter in, in this world book. It's, it's very, very good. It gives you all the basics. And many of the things I say really follow the book quite closely. Um, so if nothing can travel faster than light, right, so then any signal sent to some point P in the domain of dependence must have registered, must, must have gone through A's. That's what this tells us. And so if you have given initial conditions on the surfaces, then we can, we should be able to predict what's happening at any point P in this domain of dependence. That's a basic idea. We can, there's a related concept which is global hyperbolicity. Uh, we first uh, define the complete domain of dependence, which is just the union of the, the future and past domains of dependence. So the whole thing. And then if we have a set or sorry, manifold such that uh, manifold sigma such that the domain of dependence of this sigma is the whole manifold M, okay, then we call this sigma a Cauchy hypersurface and so it's somehow it's a, a snapshot of the universe, uh, a snapshot of the whole space-time and a space-time on, on, in the reverse uh, sense, a space-time which does possess a Cauchy hypersurface is called globally hyperbolic, okay. Let's just dwell on this for a minute because it's a, this is, it's a quite a deep concept, okay? Um, and we don't, we don't wanna, and if you have to dwell on this for five minutes, I think it's worth, you know, not getting done with everything because I think it's quite a important thing to understand, okay? Um, let's assume, well, again, so let's say this, this is our manifold here, M. And here, let's, let's assume this one in, no, no, let's, just, let's make it simple here, okay? This is, our, this is our sigma here. Now we construct the domain of dependence. Is this thing here. And well, in this case, is this, is this manifold globally hyperbolic? No, because, because this is this thing here, that's the whole domain of dependence of, of, of sigma, but it's not the whole manifold, okay? So this surface is not a Cauchy hypersurface for the whole manifold, so that we cannot predict what's here. Okay. Now uh, we can, we could very easily uh, make it a, a Cauchy hypersurface if we just identify here and there. Then light rays will actually go all the way around, and that would make the whole thing the domain of dependence, and that it will work out. Okay. It's, it depends on, you know, this is just a simple sketch of a manifold, right? If this is, if, if this uh, boundary here just, you know, doesn't let um, light let rays through in some sense, so that the domain of dependence is as I draw it here, then this is not a, this is not a uh, Cauchy hypersurface and the M is not globally hyperbolic. If actually this would be like a, a compact manifold which I have identified here and here, it's like periodic boundary conditions, then of course the light rays would just go through and, th and then this would make the whole thing uh, the domain of dependence and then it would be global hyperbolic, okay? Um, all right. So, um, and then we can show, we can show a very uh, simple but deep theorem, um, which is that if the manifold with symmetric G uh, is globally hyperbolic, so it does have a Cauchy hypersurface, then this manifold allows a global time function T. Remember that uh, Thomas has also talked about these time functions, these global uh, these foliations of the manifold, such that each surface of constant T is a, is a Cauchy hypersurface. Okay? So if in this example here, now imagine this has periodic boundary conditions. So in this case, you know, M equals domain of dependence of sigma, so the whole manifold is the domain of dependence, then we can just foliate the whole man manifold by these Cauchy hypersurfaces. And each of them is a Cauchy surface. Each of them determines the whole manifold. Okay? It's the, the basic idea of universe. So if you have the whole universe, then if you have some surface of constant time, you can predict the whole universe to the future and the whole universe to the past. And it works for every surface of constant time, okay? That's the standard case which we have in mind for the physical universe, okay? 
which is a non-pathological manifold. All right. uh, and furthermore, the topology of this manifold then has to be R, the real numbers, cross this three-dimensional manifold sigma. Okay? Which, is, which is very interesting because this means that if you, if you require that the whole manifold, the metric, can be constructed as an initial value problem, which would make sense for classical physics, it does restrict the topology, right? So this is, this is very interesting because, of course, the, the four-dimensional formulation of the Einstein equation doesn't care about the topology. You can solve the Einstein equations on manifolds which do not have that topology, but then uh, you will not have an initial value problem, okay? If you don't have an initial value problem, that means that you know, miracles can happen because you couldn't predict these things from initial data. Um, in particular, for example, globally hyperbolic space times, they do not allow closed time-like curves. And another word, of course, for closed time-like curve is a time machine. So if this would be, here we have our manifold, and then here we have a closed time-like curve, somebody built a time machine, then it's not globally hyperbolic anymore because we required that every time-like curve registers on, on this surface here. It doesn't because it makes a loop. So um, if you have a time machine, it's not globally hyperbolic. And in plain English, you don't have an initial value problem. So miracles appear. Which in other words, right, you, can, so you cannot construct a time machine in the sense of, you know, you know that if I do this, then a time machine is going to work. Because you don't have an initial value problem. You, can, you cannot say, if I do this, then the thing is going to work as a time machine because you don't have an initial value problem. You cannot predict what's happening in the future. Right? It's something I think to be aware of in the whole discussions of, you know, can you build time machines? So space times with time machines are not predictable. And uh, therefore, with, 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 all the, with all the techniques that we will discuss to solve Einstein equations numerically, they just leave this case aside. Okay, so you, we're going to get all the astrophysical solutions. But we're not going to get many of the strange solutions. They're just not, not in our, our regime. Okay, so we talked a little bit about these basic concepts. Now let's make some definitions. First, a definition of that we can work with, a practical definition of well-posedness of an evolution equation. And we first look at the continuum problem, so the partial differential equations. And so we define well-posedness. I will usually abbreviate this as WP, that a unique solution exists. And we have to remember that if you apply this to gauge theories like GR or Maxwell, that first you have to choose a gauge, because otherwise you don't have a unique solution. Right? Uh, and it ha and depends continuously on initial data. And a, 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 a useful, practical way to formulate this continuity is to say that uh, you can find some appropriate norm so that the solution at time t is bound, the norm of the solution at time t is bounded by the norm of the solution at the initial time. Okay? And to make it technically specific, the usual way of doing it is to say they have to exist real numbers a and k so that the norm at some future time is bounded by k e to the at, norm of the initial data for all possible initial data sets. Right? If you can find... Hmm? So, right, right. This is the, you need this because in general you can have growth that's consistent with well posedness, and uh, if you have source terms, and so that's why you have to put this in. Okay. So I, I don't want. I mean, it's not too difficult. I think to just derive this. I don't, don't, we don't want to spend the time on this. Okay. And it's kind of intuitive that if you want to formulate continuity, it's it's equivalent to having some kind of condition where you bound the solution on the, on the, by its initial data. And of course, you have to find what actually is an appropriate norm. And we talk about this afterwards. Okay. What this tells you, right, is for example, it's OK for these partial differential equations to describe an unstable system, and a, sta a, a system which may uh, show exponential growth. That's completely OK. That doesn't violate well-posedness. It just is not allowed to basically grow arbitrarily fast. Okay. This is also sometimes called mode stability. So you somehow you can have different modes, like different frequencies, which just, tr which just grow arbitrarily fast. Uh, 
what typically happens for ill posts, so not well posed problems, problems where this is violated, is that some of you, if you have higher frequencies in your initial data, they grow faster, they grow, correspond to a larger value of A and K. And so, for example, if you have a better numerical solution which resolves higher frequencies, then you have more growth and somehow a, a worse approximation. So, that doesn't really make sense. And these are the, these are the problems which are not well posed and which do not give you predictable time evolution. So this is for the continuum problem and it turns out that we can carry over these this definitions almost exactly in the same way to the discrete problem, to the numerical problem. We could, uh, we could again call this the well posed discrete problem. Usually we just call it the stable problem. And this, is this, this sometimes this creates some confusion because in the continuum problem we would call stable in the more, the more physical sense of is, this, you know, is the solution growing or not. Where here, numerically stable means just, does, it, does it make sense? Okay? Is it consistent? Does it, does it, is, is there any predictability? Okay. So doing this now for, an, for a discrete problem in an iterative sense, so we have you know, time steps in, then we would uh, say, for example, that the solution V at time step n plus 1 is some operator, which we call here Q, which can be depend on the time, those the, the, the previous solutions, the same solution step here. This operator applied to the previous time step Vn. Okay? And then, so this is like the update operator Q. We call it Q also yesterday. And um, then we will have a very similar condition that the norm of time step n has to be bounded by the norm at time step 0 times, again, the similar expression, k to the e alpha tn. The important thing here is that what appears here is e to the alpha t and not, for example, e to the alpha n. Okay? So you could have exponential growth in your numerical solution. And if the growth is like e to the lambda t, that's okay because the system may grow as e to the lambda t. What is not okay is that it grows like e to the lambda n. Because if, if you make a delta t smaller, you have more time steps n, it would grow faster. That, that, that makes no sense because then this growth is not physical. Okay? So, for example, you, have, you, you, you did your uh, code for, some, for the wave equation or for some other partial differential equation, and you find out it grows exponentially. The first thing that you can do is you can check. You do it different resolutions, and you check, is it growing exponentially as a function of time or as a function of time step? If it's a function of time step, something's clearly wrong. If it's a function of time, that may or may not be the physical solution that you want. Okay? Okay, and then there's an, a very, very important basic theorem of numerical analysis, which is called the Lux equivalence theorem, which asserts that if you have a consistent, which means that's what we talked about yesterday, of a consistent, a formally convergent finite difference scheme for a linear partial differential equation for which the initial value problem is well posed, so for which the continuum equations to satisfy this condition here then it's convergent if and only if it's stable. Okay? So what you're interested in as a physicist is, is it convergent to the correct physical solution? The thing that's easy to check is if it's stable. Okay? Um, and this theorem asserts you that, that uh, so you can do your convergence test. You find out, well, it's, it's actually, it's, it doesn't look so good. Do I have to go to a smaller time step? Is something wrong? What, what this uh, uh, theorem asserts is that if your continuum problem makes sense, then if, if your code is correct, eventually going to a, a smaller time step, it has to, um, you know, if, if, your, uh, if your code is correct, your algorithm is, is stable, which is maybe easy to check, then it does have to converge eventually for small enough time step to the correct solution, okay? Now, um, so we have seen before, we have made this uh, proof of existence and that the solutions exist in the analytic case. We've seen that about analytic in the physical, for physical theories, for relativistic theories, doesn't really make much sense. So um, what can we do in general? How, do we, how does it actually do for smooth solutions? How does it work? And so how we're going to do this is now we will sketch uh, 
an outline of how we can prove well posedness for the Klein Gordon equation. And then we will see that there are, there are some very general notions of hyperbolic equations, which generalize in some sense the Klein Gordon equation, and where we can make statements about well posedness for the whole, for all set of equations which um, fit into some general scheme. All right, so let's just look at how this works. Uh, and we'll just do a very, very basic layout. We'll don't, we don't have time to go through the proof in detail. Okay, so here's, here's the Klein-Gordon equation. Uh, I add this mass-dependent term because it turns out that it's technically slightly simpler with this term if m is not equal to zero. Um, there's an energy momentum tensor associated with that. It's divergence free. Here is the energy momentum tensor. I use the same. So this is, for example, some flat space. I use eta AB for the Minkowski metric, just as Thomas does. Here is a picture that shows uh, it's consistent with what we talked about before. So here is our initial hypersurface, sigma 0, a later one, sigma 1. There is S0, S1 is um, some region of this uh, initial hypersurface, a finite, a finite spatial region. Uh, there's a part of this kind of cone which limits the domain of dependence and S0 is one of the cuts of uh, the, the domain of dependence defined by the initial surface and, and sigma 1. All right. We have to ask for some or we, we will use some specific properties of the Klein-Gordon equation. One of the properties we are going to use is that it's linear. Another property is the so-called dominant energy condition. Who, who has heard of the, the, the energy conditions in GR weak? Strong, dominant, a few of you, all right? Okay, so, so let me just say uh, two or three words about the energy conditions. You can, matter is described by the energy momentum ten tensor TAB. You could just invent some energy momentum tensor, or your, your new interaction, some energy momentum tensor. But it does make sense to require some basic properties of these energy momentum tensors, which are called uh, energy conditions, to, to somehow characterize that they are consistent with typical properties of, um, of matter. So for example, one thing that you could require, which we don't require here, is that the energy density measured by some observer is non-negative. You may require that. We don't do require that here. We require a different condition, which is called the dominant energy conditions, which is a reason bit technical at first, if we have some future directed time like, time -like vector, so uh, the, a potential tangent vector of some observer, call it VA, then projecting the energy momentum tensor in this way, what is this? This has an interpretation, right? It's the, it's the, it's the mass energy flow which can, which is observed by this observer uh, V, okay, and the dominant energy condition requires that this, this combination here is a future directed time like or null vector. If this is a future directed time like or null vector, what it means is that the, the mass energy flow ca cannot be observed to be faster than the speed of light. That's a very reasonable assumption to make on the energy momentum tensor, and you can check, it's not so hard to check. Then, of course, for the Klein-Gordon equation, that's true. That's satisfied. Otherwise, it would be very strange. Okay? And then, we can, what we can do, so now this, this uh, because it's, it's time-like, we know something about its norm. We can convert this to an inequality. And we can also, this is a divergence, uh, divergence of t is free. So we can use the Gauss law to convert divergences between a volume and the surface integral. And we can rewrite, the, rewrite this as the following inequality, that the integral over some surface S1, which is, you know, which is this one here, so at a later time, uh, is bounded by the same quantity measured at the initial time. Okay? And so what is this energy, what is this quantity here? Well, it's something like the energy of the field. The energy of the field, it has a, this is a potential energy contribution and a, like a kinetic energy contribution. Okay? And if this is this domain of dependence, what, what this is telling us is that if we have some initial energy here, what can happen to the initial, what can happen to the energy? Well, it can be preserved, it can still be here, or the, the field has gone out to the sides. So therefore, the energy at S1 is less or equal than the initial energy. 
Okay, we can conclude this from uh, divergence free property of T and from the dominant energy condition. If, if, if the dominant energy condition wouldn't be satisfied, then energy can flow faster than the speed of light, and so it can, can uh, come in from the sides, and then these inequalities are obviously not, not necessarily satisfied anymore. Right? And so what we see that after we have proven this, proven this inequality, we see that we're basically, we're basically almost there to show well positiveness because what we had to do, we had to show this inequality in terms of initial data. And here we have it already, actually, with, with k equals 1 and a equals 0. Right here it is. This is, this is, this is it. Yeah? So looking at the physical properties of the field, which is described by this partial differential equation, we have been able to derive an expression for the energy, which is preserved in this sense, and we can only decay within the domain of dependence. And this is essentially the well positiveness. That's what we needed. Okay? Yeah. Why, why we have this inequality? Um, you, you mean, you mean uh, what it means or how to derive it? Okay, so why is it not an equality? Well, because you can, have, you can have energy leave through the sides. So energy can go away because it's, you hear what we have done? We have a, we have a finite region of fi S and S1 is finite. So there will be some boundaries and it can go away. If, if S0 would be the whole spatial domain, the whole infinite spatial domain where energy can't get out, then of course we would have to have energy conservation. But very typically we think of some situation where you know, we, we have some finite region but there's some energy. We look at the same region later and it's going to be less energy because some went out. Okay? Yeah. Well, well, energy. So, so what we have, what we have required here, that there's no, there's no energy flow in space because it, it, the energy flow can only be along time-like or null direction. Okay, if there would be. If there would be energy flow in a space-like direction, it would mean that the energy flow is faster than the speed of light, and that's what we said we, can, we, we do not want to have. So it cannot have any component along the same time direction. I mean, uh, of, the the flow. of the energy flow. Right, exactly. Right. So mm -hmm. the energy is to be conserved. Then uh, there should be an equal thing, right? No, 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 no. No, it's because what, look. So what we are, let me, let me make the same picture here again. But, you know, Reminding you of the, the, the domain of dependence story which we had before. So we start here. This is our S0. That would, that, so this would be no, no time like uh, close time like curves. This thing here, this region is D plus of S. This is the set of points which are determined by initial data here. Okay? In this plot, what we have done is we take a, a little later time. Not, we don't go up to here. We just go up to here. So this thing to here. Well, that is S1. Okay? And now what happens with the, with the energy which we have here initially? The energy can go up here. Or, you know, some, some photon, which is part of the energy, it, it just went, went here, went right out of the domain of dependence. And so therefore the energy here later is less in general. Okay? And because we satisfy the dominant energy condition, we can't shoot in more energy because we just, you know, we can shoot in more energy like this but not along a space-like direction. Okay? If, if this thing is like the whole universe, of course, nothing can get lost, and the energy is conserved. Uh, you can also assume that the boundary doesn't have sort of inverse flows of energy outside. What I have, so no, what I, what I, what I have assumed here is that, that we're really talking, we, that we have assumed that we restrict ourselves to the domain of dependence, okay? If the, if the boundary would be, let's say, this, a time-like boundary, then it's not the domain of dependence. And here, of course, I can send, I can send in information. It's because we are now restricting ourselves for this purpose on the domain of dependence.
Um, all right. I think I, I actually want to save maybe some time. You can read it by yourself. Um, the main thing we have seen, right, the main thing for well positiveness was that we have this kind of norm on the data. We have these equations that we're basically done. There are some further details. For example, we can see that there can be at most one solution in the domain of dependence with given initial data. How do we do this? We use linearity. Let's assume that there are two solutions with the same initial data. Then we just take the difference. So the difference by linearity is also a solution. It has vanishing initial data because we said they have the same initial data, so the difference initially is zero. Okay? And then the if you just insert this, right, this right hand side vanishes because the initial data are zero, so the initial energy is zero. Therefore the final energy has zero, but it's a quadratic expression, so everything has to be zero. So there can there has to be a unique solution. So we get both continuity and uh, uniqueness. The same argument we can say that if you vary the initial data outside of S0, so we have here our zero, S0, and we say now, now we vary, we change the solution here. Of course, this cannot have any effect on what happens inside of the domain of dependence. And here we can see this because varying the solution here doesn't change the initial data here. So with the same argument of linearity, we have the same initial data, unique solution, and varying the, da the data doesn't change the solution here. Um, all right. There is, we can, there is actually there's a, a huge game that we can play in working with other norms which don't uh, directly give us a restriction on the energy, but, but, but directly on the fields, directly on phi, directly on phi dot. And these uh, gen more general norms that people work with are called Sobolev norms. I don't want to say anything except that, again, in this wall GR book, I think there's quite a, quite a tractable, understandable, short, introduction of what these mathematical objects are. If you're more interested, I, I highly recommend that. Um, all right, and so then we could proceed to the actual, the actual existence proof. Right, so we have seen that if there are solutions, they're unique, and it do depend on the, on the initial data, we don't know whether any solutions exist. Okay? So what do we do to show that any solutions exist? Well, actually, uh, we go back to this cauchy kovalevsky theorem we say that uh, for any analytic initial data solutions exist, okay? And then we say, okay, actually it turns out that any um, smooth initial data set, we can approximate that by, initial, by, by analytic initial data for which a solution will exist. And then there's some technical things which we have to check that, that we have to write convergence of this analytic approximation to the correct smooth solution, and using these arguments, you can, you can now see existence for the whole, um, for, for, for general smooth initial data. But again, it's something which is more technical. It's important to understand what's the basic idea, but not the technical details. What's important is that, uh, unlike this cauchy kovalevsky theorem, uh, this proof uses very specific properties of the wave equation. We have used linearity conservation of energy momentum, the dominant energy condition. And, and so this proof would not work for the Laplace equation, and it shouldn't, because the Laplace equation doesn't have a well posed initial value problem. Now, doing the whole proof is quite a lot of work, and, and we don't want to do this proof for every single partial differential equation which we encounter, in particular since you know, the, 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 the Klein-Gordon equation is really simple. But we don't want to do this for you know, the Maxwell equation and the Einstein equation, every single case we ever have. So the question is, do, can we obtain such a proof for a very general class of equations? We just do this once, and then we just have to check whether a particular equation is within this class. And the answer is, of course, yes. That, that turns out to be true. So let's see how this works. Now, actually, how am I? So I have like 22 more minutes or something like this, right? Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Well, if I don't have a particular ambition to, to finish this. We have you know, more days. Um, all right. So before talking about general classes of PDEs, let's talk about nonlinear PDEs a little bit. And so in, in general nonlinear PDEs, you, you, know, you sleep, you dream of some partial differential equation, nonlinear, write it down the next day. Um, there will not be general theorems that tell you what happens. They have to be discussed on a case-by-case -case basis. Every, everyone's different. But there is an interesting uh, subcase 
which are called, which are the quasi-linear partial differential equations, which are linear in the highest derivatives. Okay, the part of the partial differential equations which contains the highest derivatives this is also what we call the principal part. This determines the basic character of the PDE. Uh, the coefficients of this principal part, they are allowed to depend on, on the independent variables, the lower order, the lower order derivatives, but, uh, but not, but in the highest derivatives it has to be linear, okay? If you, if you look at your, your notes from, from Thomas lectures and you look at how the Einstein tensor depends on the, on, on the metric, derivatives of the metric and the Christoffels and how, um, how things are written, you I think by yourself you can check that actually the Einstein equations, the Einstein tensor expression or Ricci tensor have this property, they are quasi-linear. Okay? So the Einstein equations like many, many other uh, equations of physics, they fall into this class which we can treat general statements. All right. Um, then it turns out that there are certain classes uh, of systems which we will call so classes of quasi-linear partial differential equations which we will call hyperbolic systems of equations which do admit a well-posed initial value problem and the two important classes are what we call generalized wave equations so what, what do they have? Generalized wave equations have the form of here this is the wave operator constructed from some Lorentzian metric J and some covariant derivative operator and on the right hand side some functions which depend on the coordinates, the field and the derivatives. Okay? And the, the metric itself, this part may depend on the same objects, the coordinates, the phi's, the first derivative, but here we see that principal part has second derivatives and so the coefficients, here this metric, that may depend on everything up to the first derivative cons consistent with what we said here. Okay? Here, GAB can, has to be a, a smooth Lorentz metric, a metric with the right signatures. It doesn't have to be the physical metric. It could be the physical metric plus some other terms. Just uh, uh, putting it all together, it has to be a Lorentz metric, which means something which has signature minus plus, plus, plus. Okay? So this, this is a very, this has, this in some sense, this has like the nicest properties. If you're, a system of equations is actually a generalized wave equation, you have lots of mathematical tools, lots of results which make your life easy and you can write the Einstein equations in this form which is useful but it's not always the most useful thing and sometimes you need more general ways and the more general uh, case is so-called strongly hyperbolic systems and these are the ones which we'll investigate in a little bit more detail. Now before we talk about the systems in general we will look at a, a simple example which is the so-called advection equation. Uh, what's the advection equation? It's this equation here. Uh, we have some solution in maybe three dimensions, u of x and t, and we have the equation that d by the t of u plus some vector v, d by the x is zero. Um, what's, the, what's the physical property of this uh, of this equation, it's actually it's quite uh, easy to check that you know, we have a derivative oper here, derivative operator which is just you know, writing this in a different way. We have d by the t minus, what do we, how do we do it? Plus, plus v d by the x applied to u is equal to zero. So what we actually, what we see, right, is that somehow if, it, if we do a coordinate transformation, so this is our coordinate, this, this combination of t and x co uh, derivatives, and this coordinate is actually constant, the solution, okay? So what, what we expect that this does is that somehow the initial profile is just moved with the, with the speed v, okay? You can just try it, try to see this by yourself, uh, maybe without doing Fourier transforms, and here we look at it explicitly by using Fourier transforms, which is a very general method. So here, if you, if you think a little bit, you know, how can this work? I think you can just derive this for this particular case that what this does is just take, taking the profile, the initial profile, and just moving it at a constant speed. 
And you have to figure out whether this goes now with plus this velocity or minus this velocity, okay? <laughs> the exercise. Uh, but um, treating the, the, the equation system with this very general method of Fourier transforms, which see this comes out automatically. So let's just do this. Let's uh, define the Fourier transform of U. We define it in this way. We choose our normalization factor. We do, we do a Fourier transform e to the minus i k x. And then there's a standard result that if we Fourier, so Fourier transforms, we write it with a little hat that differentiation in real space becomes multiplication with i k in Fourier space. Okay? So let's just uh, take this equation and rewrite it now for the Fourier space variables. Uh, and so very important, I want to point this out. We don't do a four-dimensional Fourier transform, not, not in x and t, but only in x. t is just left as it is, okay? And so since t is left as it is, we just have the same thing here, dt, d by dt of the Fourier transform now, which is a function of time and the wave vector k. And now where we had a, a derivative before, now we have we have v vector v times the derivative. We have minus i scalar product of the vector v with the vector k. Multiplied now just algebraically with the Fourier transform. Okay? Now, if you look at this, uh, then something amazing happens because the, the uh, derivative has gone away. We have a simple multiplication, which means that for every vector k, this is just an ordinary differential equation. Okay, so now we see that when we did when we did ODEs yesterday, it wasn't just as a warm up, because it's it's instructive to first understand ODEs. It's actually ODEs are the tool to understand PDEs because in Fourier space PDEs are just ODEs, uh, but an infinite family, right? Because now we have one ODE for every value of the wave vector, so there's an infinite family now of ODEs. Yeah, right. I mean, it's, it's uh, the way we are presenting this here now is, of course, it really is tuned to an initial value problem. Um, but but uh, this, this kind of decomposition, you can always do that. Now, uh, so now we have, so now we have realized that this is just a family of ODEs. Now, for each of these fam each of these ODEs, we can just write down the explicit solution, which is just you know, e to the minus i, v, scalar product of v with k, times t, times t, initial solution. So we have solved it in Fourier space. We don't want it in Fourier space, we want it in real space, just Fourier transform back. Uh, here we, cho we choose this, the normalization factor so that we have the same one in both directions. Now here we have e to the minus i, e to the plus i, Fourier back, and what we see is, so now here we have, um, the initial data as a function of k. I wrote this here explicitly as initial data of function of k and time is equal to zero. We insert for, so here we have an e to the i k x from the inverse Fourier transform. We have this term e to the minus i k v t from here. And what this expresses is this just the solution is u zero of x minus v t. So this is what I claimed before which you can try to just see that without Fourier transform. If here, this is now, this is x. If our initial profile is this, this is u0. You are the, the initial time. At a later time, it's exactly the same profile, moving with the speed v. And even later time, it's the same thing, OK? In some sense, this is like this is the, the fundamental equation which the, describes any type of flow, like the time, like the, the kind of fluid flow that David is going to talk about next week. But the, the fundamental thing that the fluid can do is just move in the same direction. That's described by this advection uh, equation. And, and so advect, right, means that here we, all, we would say that the initial profile is just advected with, just moved with a, with a velocity v. The great thing that we have seen here is we haven't just treated this particular equation, but we have seen that uh, if we have constant coefficients, like this coefficient v here doesn't depend on x, 
we can use the Fourier transform method. So that we require this, require that it is linear. But as soon as this is uh, satisfied, any PDE can be solved in the same way, right? Uh, another thing that we can see is that the norm of the solution remains constant. Because the solution is just shifted, so that the norm is constant. If the norm is constant, the equation is automatically well posed, right? Um, and some of the, really the, the key idea which we have learned here is that the constant coefficient linear case, it can be solved explicitly by just transforming it to Fourier space and interpreting it as an as a ordinary differential equation. Okay? Now, if you have non-constant coefficients, what you can think of as you know, having, if, if you have a pH, if you, <laughs> if you have a PDE, but this is not constant, B is not constant, you could like microscopically zoom in to some small space-time region over which it would be constant, okay? Just a different constant in different regions of the space-time. So if you want to understand if this type of equation, does it have solutions? Are they well posed, okay? Well, just freeze it in to a particular value, zoom in to some small region of space-time, then you can use these methods, and if it's if it's well posed in some small region, uh, it's, a, it's a consistent equation, then it's in general, it's, it's okay also, in general. So this, this is a very general thing to do. If it's, if it's not linear, if it's non-linear, uh, well you cannot use this method, but uh, you can always think of uh, a non-linear solution as linearized uh, with respect to some background. And if it turns, so if, if the linear perturbations with respect to some background solution, uh, but they, if they are well posed, if they don't grow exponentially and without control, then again, things are okay. Then you can use some kind of iterative procedure to show that you know, small, um, small perturbations, they, they, they converge again to a well-defined nonlinear um, solution. But then this is more technical. All right. So this was we are not explicitly treated a single equation and we've learned that we can use this Fourier method. Let's go ahead and let's look at systems of, of equations. So let's uh, consider first order differential system here. So it's first order in time, right? dt of the solution is uh, uh, some matrix times the spatial derivatives. Now it's a system, right? So u has an index. We have index A, so the coefficients now become some matrix, right? Uh, let's try just the same thing that worked so well before. Let's just fully transform this again. So now we have U hat with an index. Same magic of um, derivatives are converted to multiplications. And again, we can just write down the explicit solution in Fourier space. The, the fact that it's a system doesn't, didn't uh, cause any trouble. Uh, now if you want to interpret what, what this does here, it turns out it's useful to choose a spatial direction and just do the analysis direction by direction. Okay? Spatial direction means we choose a unit vector n normalized to 1 and then we can write the wave vector k as the unit vector times the modulus of k. I'll just write it uh, again. Therefore, we have ua uh, of, as a function of the absolute value, the direction n and t is e to the i. And here we had a, b, a, the indices of the, sol of the solution component, and then j, the spatial index. And now, uh, scalar product of this index with k, with a wave vector. And now this just becomes a n a in the direction of this unit vector times the absolute value of k. This turns out to make things a lot more tractable. Okay. And now we just do exactly the same thing as yesterday. We say, oh, all right. I know how to compute that. I uh, write my matrix in this normalized form, in the Jordan form. I find a similarity transformation to write it as a diagonal matrix plus a needle potent one. Then I can write the uh, matrix exponentially e to the i a k t. I can write it, factor it this way, and 
uh, e to the i d k t is this thing here, and then here I have this term where the exponential breaks off at a certain term because at some point this um, this power of the nilpotent part is just zero, right? Okay. So let's uh, let's look at a few cases. What this for what this formula is telling us, if if the matrix A, if the principal part matrix is diagonalizable, then this means that n is zero, and the solution is just e to the i d k t times the initial values. Okay. If the eigenvalues of this matrix D are real, then this expression here is just an oscillatory expression. Okay, and because it's just oscillatory, it has it preserves the norm, and it's obviously uh, well posed, just as the uh, advection equation. For the physical interpretation, is also if we if we go into the the um, basis where this matrix A is diagonalized, right? Then we have we have kind of this, we have the same system of equations, just here is a D which is a diagonal matrix, which really just means that, um, I want just to make this really clear, clear what's, what's happening here at this step, if you would have the system of, how did I write this, d by dt, now let's write the solution maybe as ud. So this is now in the basis where the principal part is diagonalized, which is not the same basis which I used initially to write down this equation, but we have to do the transformation. Then this is the matrix D times, uh, so we, we use the index uh, J here, at DJ times DJ and the solution UD. But now, now this is diagonal, so this just means that you know, UD, the first component, UD1 dot, is equal first eigenvalue lambda one times you know d, and then for the second one is the same thing. So this this is just the advection equation for this component with speed lambda one, and for the second component is the advection equation with speed lambda two. So these eigenvalues just become the speed of the corresponding advection equation. So after doing this transformation from our initial u to these uds, in which the equation is diagonalized, each of these linear combinations of evolution variables just is advected with a constant speed. So it looks very, very, now here in this basis, the solution looks very, very similar, uh, very, very simple, sorry. Uh, and because these eigenvalues are speeds, we have to uh, expect that they have to be real, right? Um, and it turns out that if they are real, if these are real speeds, then this is just a, a bounded expression, it's just uh, oscillatory, and the norm is preserved. Looking at, so, so taking the similarity transformation, applying it to the variables, just P, uh, scalar product with U, so in this notation here would have that UD is equal to PU, applying the, the, the similarity transformation, we call these new quantities characteristic variables. The characteristic variables are those which, where the information propagation is like for the advection equation. They propagate with a, with a finite real speed, which corresponds to the eigenvalue of the principal part. Okay? Uh, so we said that the Fourier domain solution is oscillatory, it does preserve the norm. If, so this is a very simple case, right? We have we didn't have any lower order terms. We could have like a constant term, or just a term uh, proportional to the u itself. We could have a general, we could have, here we had ut is a du, but we could have other terms here as well, okay? What happens if we have these lower order terms? The solutions can look more complicated. For example, we can uh, get exponential growth, okay? But the speed of propagation, like the, the microscopic properties of how fast this, the solution propagates, uh, this depends only on the principal part, it depends only on the matrix A, so only on the part with the highest derivatives, and so therefore also the well-posedness, whether the initial value problem makes sense, it only depends on the algebraic properties of this matrix A. 
Okay? This is really very nice because we have, here we can treat very, very complicated, very, very general systems. In principle, the nonlinear part here could be so that the, the lower order part, it could just depend nonlinearly on U, U, for example. So this is a very, very wide range of systems that we can treat. And the only thing that we have to do to understand whether these equations are well posed, whether they make sense, is just take this matrix A and uh, look at its eigenvalues and eigen, eigen uh, vectors, okay? which is very simple, just linear algebra. Okay? Do I not have five more? Five minutes, okay. Um, all right, so this was, the, this was the nice case. The nice case is when it's diagonalizable and the eigenvalues are real. What happens when it's not that nice, okay? So um, if it's not so nice, we do have this part here. We do have this uh, uh, nilpotent matrix. It's not diagonalizable. And we call this that there are Jordan blocks. And what they do is they will cause a frequency-dependent polynomial growth. How does this happen? Well, because of this is here, if, if there's an n, there are these terms here, they grow polynomially in time, and they do depend on k as well, on the frequency vector. So it's a frequency-dependent growth, and frequency-dependent growth is not consistent with um, our well-posedness condition, is not consistent with this, because if you have a growth which depends on the initial data, yeah, and, and higher frequencies in the initial data create stronger growth, then we violate this condition. So as soon as we have a non-diagonalizable principal part, it's over. Okay? We still have to understand what it means in practice because now this is a little bit abstract, a little bit mathematical. We have to see maybe some examples. Okay? All right. So for example, we could hear this, an equation that is going to appear later. Um, let's assume we have we had some system of equations which here it has one, two, three, or six components, a six-dimensional state vector, which just you know, went and computed a Jordan normal form of this matrix. This is the result, and we say, well, it's, this is the Jordan normal form. It's not diagonalizable because there's this off-diagonal parts. Here there's an off-diagonal one, another off-diagonal entry, right? We see that. Okay, so the eigenvalues are minus ones and plus ones. So there are three modes which propagate to the left at speed one, three modes propagate to the right at speed one. Okay? But there is off diagonal terms which ruin the nice properties and which cause this frequency dependent growth. Uh, if the eigenvalues are not real, but they're actually complex, so if, if D has, if the eigenvalues here in this D are actually complex, then you will obviously have exponential growth. The exponential growth does depend on the frequency. And so then, it's, uh, uh, then it doesn't make any sense. The problem doesn't make any sense. Right? It's not just uh, this kind of weak growth here, but it's a much, much wilder pathology. I will also see this happen if, you know, maybe in some examples. Okay? And then uh, for both cases here, you do not have well -posedness. Okay. Uh, let's conclude for today with a classification that we can derive from this for hyperbolic systems. The weakest class is called weakly hyperbolic. This means when all the eigenvalues of the principal part are real. Okay? So eigenvalues means the speeds. It turns out that if you don't have any lower, lower order terms, like this plus c or plus d times u or something. If you don't have any of those, you can construct some kind of artificial norm which gives you the mathematical properties of well-posedness, but they are not robust. If any kind of small perturbation ruins this. So this is not, not well-posed in any physically useful sense. Okay? The stronger version, it's called strongly hyperbolic. It's the same conditions. It's weakly hyperbolic. but it has a complete set of eigenvectors. This means that the characteristic variables span the solution space, and that just means nothing else, then it's <coughs> diagonalizable. If it's diagonalizable, then the eigenvectors form a basis of the 
vector space. And so this is the diagonalizable case. And in this case, you have a well-posed initial value problem, just as we discussed in our example here. Right? If, this, uh, if, if this term doesn't appear, and the eigenvalues here are real, then everything's nice. You can make this even stronger because Right, remember that in order to write this down, we, we chose some space-like direction in. And so we have treated our equations as one direction at a time. And for each direction, we constructed the similarity transformation P. If it turns out that for all directions, you can use the same similarity transformation P, then this is called symmetric hyperbolic. Okay? So strongly hyperbolic with some extra property. And it turns out that we're not going to exploit this. That if you have this property, then you can actually uh, construct such a conserved energy, like what we constructed for the Klein-Gordon field. And you can use this to not just prove uh, well-posedness for the initial value problem, but it allows you also to treat boundary conditions. Okay? And because, something that's important to remember, because in one dimension, there's only one direction which you can choose. In one dimension, one space dimension, strongly hyperbolic is always symmetric hyperbolic. There's another notion, but for us it's not uh, going to be relevant. Strictly hyperbolic is when all eigenvalues are distinct. Uh, OK, let's, actually, let's just continue for 30 more seconds. I think this is a better place to stop. So let's uh, summarize now. So hyperbolic systems, a few remarks. So we had this quasi-linear case. This is when nonlinearities are only in the lower order terms, not in the principal part. Um, then we can analyze well posedness. We have done it for the linear case, linear constant coefficients, but it turns out with a bit heavier mathematics that it does carry over uh, to nonlinear cases, considering, for example, linearizations around some background. Well posedness doesn't mean that the solutions cannot uh, become uh, unstable or um, exponential growth or even singular in finite time. Well, positive only guarantees the existence of solutions for small time. In some sense, the partial differential equations initial value problem cannot be better behaved than the one for ODEs. Okay? Uh, what we found was that it was very convenient to have a first order in time formulation to do these tricks with the, with the Fourier domain. We can ask about what happens in, if you have higher differential orders. And we talk about this a little bit tomorrow. And it turned out that this uh, thing with higher differential order, as it is, for example, the case for the Einstein equations, the Einstein equations have second differential order, as you have seen in Thomas' lectures. This took quite a while to figure out how this works. And it really took until about between like end of the 90s, 2006 or so, by a number of people to really under analyze what are the initial value properties of the Einstein equations, which by now are quite well understood. So let me stop here. There's just a little bit more, a few slides, which we're going to do tomorrow, some examples. Okay? And then in the, in the exercises afterwards in the lab class, we'll just continue with the ODEs and before the exercise, you just get a, a few handouts again, which help you uh, for today's work. Thanks.